Hey, Stefano, how are you? Hey, Shauna. <laughs> Great. That's I know. Awesome. I was going to say, we, we've been doing the same conference together and we're in different parts of the globe. And so this is weird us being on stage, but not really on stage together. So um, yeah, it's been no, great listening to some I of your sessions. But I always love doing that with you. Yeah, I was going to say, it's been great listening to each other's sessions. And um, so much of the science this morning, or whatever part of the day you are, so much of the science. Yeah. That's right, exactly. So much of the science. We wanted to really frame the discussion, didn't we? We wanted to have the understanding of what this disease is about. And actually, as the rest of the day progresses, you have questions or thoughts that come up relative to masking, infection control, that kind of thing. We recommend you go back to listen to those uh, videos because they did have pretty much everything you could possibly ask about this disease that was addressed there. So I just wanted to level set and welcome our global audience again. So this is the COVID-19 summit and it is the orthopedic response. Um, we're part of the Doc SF team. We've got mighty people behind um, the screens that are helping make this happen. And um, that's from the Doc SF side. And we're really thrilled this time on this particular project to have the American Association of orthopedic surgeons join us and help convene the global thought leaders in orthopedic surgery to, and the, the goal that we've had with this is very practical. We have, we're in uncharted territory. We got to rethink how it is that we deliver orthopedic care. And we need to think about that from the clinical standpoint, from the practice standpoint, from the institution, from the patients, from the caregivers. There's nobody that has been unaffected. So those existing <coughs> practice paradigms that we've had and policies and protocols, they're, they're not serving us very well. We can't use them. So we've really reached out to a global audience to help us think A, through the science, um, also then through the technologies that we're going to have to use because of being in a place of physical distancing, um, working in an environment where there's a high threat pathogen with no vaccine available and thinking about it also from a new economic paradigm. So, and then our, our, our institutions are having to operate very differently. So that's why we brought everybody together. And Stefano, you are such a thought leader in embracing the technologies in thinking about specifically in the orthopedic space. What are these places for us to go digital and virtual first. So um, we've got in the next set of talks coming up, we're really gonna be looking at what are these new, actually they're not new digital tools. They've been around for a while, but now there's an urgency to use them. And I think that there's a new problem because so many people are bringing them into their, into their practice and into their mindset. We gotta get, we gotta move really swiftly. So our goal with this is to introduce folks to a different, you know, way of thinking in this environment and a set of tools that can really help them practically solve their challenges. So why don't I let you take it from there? Unless sure. you want to have something else before I mess with the controls. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, you, you, you set up correctly. I'm now going to introduce people to sort of a, a series of ideas of thoughts. When I go dive and deep dive in some of these technologies as the rest of the day progresses and as tomorrow comes online. One of the thoughts that Shauna brought up, uh, this idea of seeding the conversation, uh, we realized that uh, everybody's now familiar with the telehealth visit. What they may not be familiar with is all these other technologies. The other thing they may not be familiar with, or actually should say, with lack of familiarity comes a certain amount of fear. And the fear of technology often gets people sort of on their back hunches, like, ah, maybe not yet, let somebody else try it. So for the rest of two days, we're going to only go, not only go into the technology itself, we're also going to go into all the ch uh, how to overcome the challenges of deploying it. And so I'm going to give you a bit of an outline in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to go deeper uh, over the next few days. And Shauna, just because I think it's important to address this, it's not just the fear of technology. There's also a bit of a fear of the patient, isn't there now? Yeah. And you know what? Um, this is not the first time we've been in this experience. And so I think we need to call on some historical moments. And after you go through some of the the um, uh, reticence maybe that we have about new ways of doing things, let's talk about the personal 
um, you know, the, the places that we have concerns about ourselves, our family and our colleagues and our patients. Very good. Okay. So uh, again, I'm Stefan Ovini. I'm the, I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at UCSF. I do primarily hip and knee replacement surgery. I'm also the chief technology officer of the department with a role that's, that is to try to uh, help create a more digitally uh, friendly solution, digitize that part of the patient experience that we can uh, to, in order to optimize the experience for our patients and meet them where they are. Um, so what I want to do today is take a, a look at how we can find digital solutions to solve the problems that we have now, which are really the COVID problems, which also exist in a more, uh, more traditional analog world. Now, again, this idea of digital, it does not have to be disruptive. It doesn't have to completely disrupt the way you do business. There's a great article in the Harvard Business Review about this very topic and points out that it's more of an incremental bridging we're going to go through over the next decade. We're going to go through the analog environment that we're all familiar with and comfortable with. And we're going to start deploying technology within that environment that will bring us closer and closer to the future of care, which will be a time when we talk about care delivery, not digital care delivery. It'll simply be part and parcel of that continuum, which will include the in-person, the uh, the empathy, all that stays. But you'll see that technology can help solve problems that will make that will simply help us to deliver better care. Another interesting article that was very important, uh, and although this was about building an artificial intelligent powered organization, I would say this is this argument they're making is really fair for pretty much across the board digital technology. The technology isn't the biggest challenge to deploying the technology itself, it's the culture that, uh, that it's put into. And that nearly 90% of companies that have successful scaling practices spend more than half of their budget, not on the technology, but on the socialization of that technology, that change in culture, that giving people the time and the space to, come, to become comfortable with the technology so they can use it well. So these are the kinds of pain points that we get a chance to address when we're using tech, connectivity. You'll hear about companies that will connect hospitals and healthcare systems. We heard earlier uh, about the ability to assist an ICU in a small town from hospitalists in a large system. That can happen through these great platforms. Communication between patients, amongst patients, between patients and clinicians, documenting, the th documenting in a busy ER, is there a better way for us to, to do that than doing it by manual charting? How do you inform patients? How do you inform healthcare workers? How do you manage these teams? How do you track wellness, um, engaging patients in their own uh, recovery, and then help them rehabilitate? These are all areas that we can certainly address using technology. So telehealth platforms, you hear, you'll hear later from CloudBreak, it's one of these platforms. They can connect hospitals, they connect systems, they can provide translation services, are something that's already, well, it's probably the best established part of the digital health revolution at this time, at least in the United States, but I think elsewhere as well. There's also surgical scheduling platforms, we'll hear from one of them, the ability to take all that paperwork that we've done in the past and create a digital file where all that information is managed so that if there's a cancellation, which is a very topical problem right now for many practices, all that information can be very quickly redeployed where it needs to be so that pretty much everything around the um, around the uh, preparation of the patient for surgery, getting the uh, approvals from the health, from the insurers, getting the time, et cetera, all that is already done and does not have to be repeated. And furthermore, allows you to, to search for patients rather than go through a book. There, we're gonna be hearing from Get Well Loop, uh, formerly Health Loop, some of you may know it that way. It's a patient engagement platform that connects patients to an app that asks them and walks them through the recovery process. Um, this is a company called Robin. It's a virtual scribe. It literally listens to a conversation that's happening in normal language and creates a perfectly normal note on the back end with some human interface as of yet. I don't think it's 100% there, but they really can be helpful. Can you imagine if all you have to do in the busy COVID ER, you simply have a conversation with the patient 
information and all the charting is automatically done. This is technology that's available today. It doesn't have to wait till tomorrow. We also know that, for example, uh, Alexis type devices are available in many people's operating rooms and across the country. There are at least six health organizations that have uh, brought this device behind their firewalls so that you can say, hey, Alexa, these are my symptoms. Can you help me define whether or not I have COVID? Do I need to come in for a test? Can you read interpret my, and interpret my results? All this is currently available. Um, Chatbots have been deployed and here exactly how Microsoft did in Seattle. It was a really uh, excellent example of how they went in and supported healthcare system to screen patients and manage them using a chatbot interface, which we are all quite comfortable with because we use them on our, when we go shopping for devices on Amazon. Going one step further though, this can get really exciting. You've got uh, these insanely cool platforms now which can create not only a visual representation with extraordinary reality, but this software can not only listen to what you're saying for inflections in your voice or change in your voice pattern that suggest you may be angry or upset, but it can also use a camera on your laptop to read your facial expressions the same way. So now if you put this, if you attach this to an artificial intelligence uh, machine learning algorithm that can track and learn from what it's hearing, you could easily uh, identify potential uh, new patients with problems, but also this interface can access the medical record, can tell you when your office is back open for business. It can inform the patient that can back to clinic or manage them offsite. Rehabilitation platforms of patients are now at home, but they're still hurting, they still have osteoarthritis, they may still be recovering from surgery. I definitely have many patients at home who are asking questions like, okay, what exercises do I do now? I can't go to physical therapy. So we'll be hearing from uh, two platforms that provide uh, virtual physical therapy in slightly different ways. One, Force Therapeutics uh, has always focused primarily, although they do a lot of other things, but primarily on the episode of care around the surgical patient, whereas um, uh, the other platforms uh, are going to be uh, like Joint Academy, we'll be hearing from, we'll be focusing more on the arthritic patient and trying to get them uh, well. Um, and this is no longer science fiction. There's a silver chain of group in Australia that's deploying uh, the, the the power of the um, of the Hololens two uh, to literally literally bring a virtual physician to their um, to their patients in their remote outback regions of Australia. Uh, if you're trying to capture your patient reported outcome measures, and we can't have people coming in for return visits, uh, either because we're still under COVID restrictions or because at a later date, we'll be too busy seeing all the patients we have to cancel. Uh, there are companies uh, like Code Technology that will do this virtually for you and then input all that data into the uh, the health, uh, the, um, the American Joint Replacement Registry, which as a plug, because I, uh, I believe in what they're doing, I hope you're all part of and contributing data too. Uh, LeanTAS uh, is a company that uses artificial intelligence to manage resources and data. They do a great job of, uh, of using this information to help hospitals allocate resources correctly and in the best possible way. And they're doing some really cool stuff now around COVID. Um, to be, uh, we have stayed a little bit away from AI. It was too big of a, uh, a bucket to handle uh, for this conference. But if we do another one, that's and then, definitely an area of interest. Um, there's also the use of uh, uh, HoloLens type technology to have virtual meetings so that people can actually communicate with each other. Uh, this is one company, but you can get into some pretty fancy stuff again with HoloLens 2 now, where the avatars are no longer random avatars that actually look like you simply by taking a single uniplanar image from your desktop camera and then projecting you into a virtual environment uh, in which you can do some pretty cool stuff. Now, granted, this is not very COVID specific, but it does mean that what we can do in terms of sharing information and connecting across uh, platforms definitely is can get far beyond what we can do with a simple Zoom. So the pain, essentially, these are pain points that we can solve, connecting patients, communicating with them, uh, documenting how well they're doing to the electronic record in, a, in context of extremely busy environments. All of this is available to us um, uh, and is no longer uh, science fiction and you'll be hearing in the next couple of days with a lot more of these concepts. So with that, and I know I went quickly, but I wanna bring some time in for Sean to join me again and let's talk a little bit about the challenges about 
relative to deploying these technologies, but also um, a little bit around the, 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 this, this question of concern and fear. Okay. <laughs> there, I went quickly, huh? <laughs> yeah, that, that was good. You did, you did go quickly. And um, it's a lot to take on, which is great why we're going to be having these sessions recorded because a lot of people are going to go want, want to go back. And as far as looking at questions, um, what I think is exciting is people are like wanting to know what these companies are, what the names of them are. They're, they're really curious to see um, what you know, and, and think about this, when you're trying to figure something out and you are looking for what's the best app for how do I manage my favorite record collection or, you know, any of these other things, all of this stuff that we're doing right now, we're going back and forth to our colleagues, our trusted colleagues and asking them for recommendations of how are you managing patient communications? How are you looking at scheduling? How are you looking at learning in this new environment? And you know, I bring that up because we're going to have Carol Clove later today with um, Elemental Health. And one of the things that I keep running into as far as clinicians is we are asked, each one of us in our own specialties, to do new things. We're also asked to, from specialties that we're not in to come in and help with things that we've never done before. And also those people who are, you know, particularly in ICUs and emergency departments, they're very you know, this is this is their 20 things that they knew really well. And now they've gone to take on a whole new group of things that they've never done. So we got to learn really quickly. Um, and there's fear around that. There is fear of, am I going to get this right? Am I going to hurt somebody? Am I going to hurt myself? Am I going to look foolish or uninformed? And there's an enormous amount of fear that comes with adopting a new tool or a new technology. Um, and I'm, I think that that fear is, is, is healthy. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about fear, our own personal safety. So one of the things that I have the last couple of months, so I recently launched a new podcast with Johnson and Johnson and the American nurses association called see you now. We were planning that for, you know, four or five months getting the production ready. The very first episode that we released was called Lessons from Ebola. And we um, it was focused on how do you manage the outbreak globally of um, a serious, uh, uh, a high threat pathogen. And we met with the team and talked with the team at Emory's Serious Communicable Diseases Unit. They're one of the very few high containment unit. They were the very first unit to take care of patients with Ebola in the US. And you would, I mean, you listen to the episode now, I listened to the episode now and it was, you know, a lot of people have thought, wow, did they do this knowing that coronavirus was coming? No, but I will tell you, I don't think that we would have had the same conversation because when you are in the midst of the anxiety and the lack of uh, clarity and the knowledge, it's really hard to think clearly and to think straight. So in that, um, uh, getting to know them and learning more about it five years out from um, Ebola, the thing that became very clear around fear is that, and it was their chief nursing officer who said at Emory, because people were same situation, a lot of fear, a lot of misinformation, um, a lot of panic. And that came from the public, from our government leaders. It came from within our institutions. It came from within our professions. It came from patients. Everybody had fear about this unknown thing that had very serious consequences. But the thing that they decided and they said that was so fundamentally important was you can choose to fear or you can mm. choose to care. Yeah. And that, that was that fundamental shift that people made, which made all of the difference. Mm. The second thing that they learned um, was that as a unit, we need to think about, I mean, when we talk about units in healthcare, what we think about and talk about is the physical location. We don't necessarily think about the personnel that come together. And the unit that they have uh, at Emory, it's, yes, there's a place where people are seen and you take care of patients, but it was more the personnel that they brought together. And it's interesting, the thing that they talked about was how important it was to flatten the hierarchy. And from the standpoint of thinking about it, um, from the standpoint of family, and they talked about family rules. And these rules were there to keep each other safe, 
to be very situationally aware and their daily huddles that they brought together. And it was every single person who was involved. And that means environmental services, security, communications, IT, um, laboratory. So we have a tendency to think about that team as the very frontline giving direct care, but you've got to be thinking about your HVAC. And so all of those folks coming together. And again, this family rule where the hierarchy is flattened and anything that you have to offer, anything that you've seen that might be a near miss, we want to know it now. We want to talk about it as a team and we want to think through. And so it was what, what really, and they, they did, they said that this fundamentally changed who they were as human beings. It fundamentally changed how they operated as a team and as a unit. And, and these units, I mean, like I said, when we talked about a unit, these are all practitioners who work in different parts of the hospital during other times when there isn't an, an outbreak. But during an outbreak and they, they stand by ready, this was a unit that was put together 10, 12 years ago with the idea of being able to be stood up and opened within one hour. But they rehearse and they practice and they come together. And then when they went off to their separate units, all of these things that they learned in taking care of somebody with a high threat pathogen. And one of those was being situationally aware. My environment's probably dirty. I need to take care of cleaning that up. Your safety depends on my safety. My safety depends on yours. And so going through and having that, that sense of working together as a family was incredibly important. The other part was, um, again, that, that low, that, that flat hierarchy, that there really is no place, there's a no blame environment. And that no blame environment is what creates the psychological safety. And that, you know, when we talk about, we talk about the physical safety, I want to be free of the pathogen. What they found that was so important as far as process and moving this through so that you didn't contaminate something, it was a psychological safety that I can say to you, you know, um, Stefano, and it was interesting, they all go on first nine bases. There wasn't, you know, the only time they would use a, a title was to be able to identify a professional responsibility, but not how they collaborated as teams. So it gave everybody the opportunity to speak to, hey, Stefano, um, I noticed when we were doing this, here's my concern. Your PPE became potentially um, threatened. It, it, it wasn't, you know, I could see the patient maybe reaping, reaping, uh, reaching up under your garment. How can we prevent that so that they don't have that toggle? So they would talk that through and then as a team figure out, Here's a better way to put that on. So they were iterating in real time. And again, they could not stress enough the no blame environment to create the psychological safety that then created the physical safety. And the other key point that um, they talked about is communication, communication, communication. And we heard that from Luigi today um, to be very mindful that there's level of communication so that we're clear on what we're doing, but also the communication to check in. I see you. This yeah. is hard. I see you are suffering. And how, how do we as human beings communicate? Not just as clinicians, but as human beings. And communication top to bottom, lateral, all of our organizations. So um, there, there are many levels of safety that we would want to talk about and think about. And what I am, like I said, it was, it was in a remarkable um, episode. And then also I had the opportunity to talk with the nurses who stood up the unit 5B there in San Francisco 30 years ago with the outbreak of, at that point, again, a new virus that we didn't know, it was HIV, and seeing how so many people were afraid to touch, to care, um, to, to do um, operations. It was, it was, again, this place of fear and panic and having to make some really serious choices. But what we uh, learned... So so yeah. just to uh, wrap that into the technology section, the, the thing that was interesting to me was the, um, the fear was addressed in large part uh, or effectively by minimizing um, the f perception of uh, having a challenge or a problem. No, the, the word you used was um, uh, uh, with no fear environment. People don't have a fear of retribution. Uh, a no, a no blame environment. A no that, blame environment because yeah. you, can, you, you, you know you can be a, a perfectly smart person, but just can't quite figure out how to make a, a 
uh, uh, social media work or navigate YouTube or Facebook um, and yet be able to be a totally excellent surgeon. And there's nothing wrong with that. These are brand new things that nobody ever taught us. Uh, and it's for, perfectly acceptable. Yeah. And from an administrative perspective, understanding that, that is actually an issue, that people are often unwilling to, to, to just to take on technology because they, you know, they may be in a leadership position. They just don't want to look... Uh, I'm prepared. Nobody, nobody wants to look foolish. No, and, and so when you have the responsibility of a team to follow you, you want to come in and be exude confidence. And this is a great time of humility to say, I don't know yet, and to be willing to ask other people. And this is a moment, an unusual moment in time that in yeah. our workforce, we have five generations who, who learn in different ways, <clears throat> who are brought in either digital native or digital immigrants. And these tools that we're taking on, actually our youngest members of our professions are far more literate in a lot of these technologies. So it's, it's very hard when you're supposed to be the person who is knowledgeable and leading and in the leadership roles, you have authority, you have respect, you have years of experience. Technology is a leveling playing field. We're yeah. all learning this to get an epidemic is a leveling playing field, which is why that importance of a no blame environment. No blame environment. Yeah. And so uh, there's several questions. Maybe we can get into those, Sean. Oh, are there questions? Yeah. I was just oh, yeah. I was say, there are questions. And we have about uh, 13 minutes before I'm going to start off with Todd Johnson. So I'll drop off a little bit early to go and get him set up in his session. Um, and just so, yes, I, what I try to do is give everybody a, an appetizer, un aperitivo. So before we got going, it wasn't meant to be a deep dive. It was meant to say, look, this is the breadth of at least a subset. And I, as I mentioned, I didn't get into AI. AI is its own world, all the elements of AI and what we can do with it. Uh, many of the things we showed you had elements of AI, especially the chatbots with the virtual faces reading. That's elements of AI or language processing, um, natural language processing things. That's AI. But we can take that for another another conference, perhaps. Well, I did. I do want to comment on the AI piece. What I think is really interesting right now is its ability to do predictive. So from the standpoint of helping us to understand the different hotspots of where do we need to concentrate our efforts of maybe our communications around the importance of social distancing. Yeah. So they're going to be some, I think that this, the AI space is, I mean, it's already growing, but new applications. And that would be one that I would put on everybody's radar that is so, um, fundamentally important today. Yeah. Okay. What questions do we have? I, I was going to say, should we open up the question box? Oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. What new virtual tools should emerge to support special needs of teleorthopedics? You know, I do want to, before you answer that, I think it's going to be really interesting. We've been talking about telehealth for forever. We don't talk about telebanking, teletravel, you know, any of those things. I think, I really think this moment in time is we're just going to get to help and it's going to be virtual first, you know, and, and virtual first and uh, virtual, but not only. So for a lot of people that look at this as, as threatening, uh, this is going to limit my ability to, 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 to work. It's, it's not really, if we look at the United States as a whole, we don't have nearly enough orthopedic surgeons to cater to the needs of the entire population. Um, and their surgeons are very constrained in large population areas. Our ability to, to, to care for patients outside is something that's of great interest to me. And so the answer to that question specifically is that we need to, do a, we need to um, coalesce the technologies that are coming out around things that matter to us, around range of motion, the ability to track somebody's functionality, the way they ambulate through space, the way they may move their shoulder, with sensors that are applied to the patient, and maybe you ship back to the clinic afterwards. It could be multi-use after being properly UV light and alcohol uh, addressed for the vi for viruses, but nonetheless, the idea of having sensors that we can place on the patients. Now, in orthopedics, we're about motion. So most of it's going to be visual and sensors. Uh, in the world of intensive care, they've already figured this out. The patients at high risk have at home blood pressure cuffs, uh, O2 sensors that are, that are rigged as part of their internet of home things mm -hmm. that connect to their health records and give this information to physicians remotely. We are going to see a, uh, there, there actually are dozens of companies working specifically in this areas and a few will arise and I look forward to seeing them become part of our armamentarium as doctors in our ability to manage our patients remotely. 
So Reed has a great question that a lot of people have wanted to know about. How are you managing and assisting and educating the elderly or the less tech savvy patients who are reluctant to use telehealth? So can I take a stab at that one first? Um, you probably have a little <laughs> bit more experience, but I, okay. I, I just, I just want to say that there is oftentimes clinicians think my patients aren't ready. And what I will tell you from the nursing perspective, I think the clinicians aren't ready. I have not seen this issue. And what I have seen, particularly with the elderly or those who have a disability, they almost always have a support system around them. The support system tends to be a little bit younger. And people, when we talk about people with disabilities, actually, that is the wrong term. These are people with determination. And if there's anybody who's going to figure something out, it's people who um, have greater challenges in life. So I want you to answer the very specifics, but I just want to address the mindset. I once was giving a lecture and I was in a room and I turned to an older person and said something to the effect of, you know, maybe perhaps you might get some help from your kids or something. And he looked at me, I have a I have a computer science degree and I have written software for the rest of my life. Don't be an ageist. And, <laughs> and, you know, and I'm like, okay, you got me on that one. This was years ago. It was four or five years ago. And I was just being to talk about this. We all had this idea that all the people didn't get on the web. And then, hey, you know, Facebook came around and FaceTime in particular. And every person on the planet over 70 or I say with grandkids that are remote or kids that are remote got involved. And this whole idea that technology is beyond, no. I'm not going to say that it, there are challenges because if it doesn't work right away, but it hasn't been as big of an issue as we thought it would be. And it varies, it varies by population. If you're in a big, large urban center like San Francisco Bay Area, obviously we have a larger percentage of people who are very, very savvy with technology or surrounded by people who can help them. Outside of that, uh, there hasn't been. And to Shauna's point, where there's a need, there's a way. The patient that doesn't want to drive four hours to come and see you, or the patient who has multiple medical issues, whose yeah. ability to live, frankly, depends on their ability to connect, they'll figure it out. And the other part of it is that the technology itself every day gets easier and easier to use. The, the software programmers are not, uh, are not unaware that their ability to market this technology revolves around its usability. And so usability is becoming much, much easier. Yeah, it really, I was going to say, uh, the, the user experience is just, um, I, I think we're going to see this huge jump in a better user experience. Okay. Probably have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, so um, one question that comes up um, quite a bit is scheduling. So this is very, yes. again, really practical. So patient scheduling ch changes are key. How can I digitally manage and implement this? And on that same vein, there's a question also about with cancellations of planned surgeries, how are you using systems to manage and make sure you're rescheduling patients in a timely fashion? So a lot of questions about schedule management. Correct. So we were about to, we're in the process of deploying a digital scheduling platform just uh -huh. as COVID hit. And unfortunately we didn't have it in place had we had it in place, rescheduling would have been so much easier, as I mentioned, because all that patient information is already in there. One of the big challenges in scheduling, people don't realize how, long, how much effort it takes to get a patient to the operating room. And when that, that procedure is canceled, the amount of work required to bring them back is double. And so these platforms allow you to, to, to keep all that information in a single environment and really just resubmit at the top of a drop of a button. We'll hear more about that tomorrow from one company, but there are several out there, at least four or five really solid uh, digital scheduling platforms. I'm feeling the suspense of the audience and we are very practically oriented. Can you please name them? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, Doc Sparrow is the one that you'll be hearing from tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. As you caught me on top of the head, uh, the, uh, the other platforms are not coming to mind. Uh, but there, I know that I've reviewed four or five of them uh, recently to, to sort um, of maybe, see what the challenges maybe, are. Uh, I'm sorry, you caught me on that one. I was going to say, maybe you can post them on LinkedIn, you know, some of those places, because again, our purpose here is to be very tactical yeah. to make sure that we give you as many tools as possible. And I'm sure that you're going to be tweeting that out so that people who are following along and we can get the doc up to tweet it out. But our goal really with this is to provide you with um, practical information today. Um, I, I, everybody is, we are moving so swift and we have Perfectly. to move swiftly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's, none of these, all these things are hidden in plain sight. All these companies are hidden in plain sight. Just Google the terms and you'll find uh, everybody comes up very quickly. 
Well, um, and with that, I'm going to, Shauna, I'll probably yeah. let you take a couple more questions. You probably handle them. And I go off now and go and welcome uh, Todd Johnson, uh, who yeah. is the CEO of one of these companies we're talking about, namely uh, Get Well Loop. He'll talk to us about patient engagement platforms. So I'm going to uh, just jump off for a second it's and go get nice ready. It's nice spending a little bit of time with you, with you. So anyway, <laughs> see you later. Bye. All right, guys. Um, thank you so much for following along and for um, really great questions. Um, I was just looking a couple. Let's see if I got some over here. All right. One of the ones um, around patient teaching and also staff. Um, we're going to have Carol Clove. She's the chief nursing officer with um, Elemento Health. And as we were talking about, each one of us are being, we're being asked to do new procedures or we're doing procedures we haven't done in a long time. And trying to teach people how to do that in real time is, uh, it's time consuming and we got to do it super fast. We're, we're, this is put all of this learning on steroids. So Carol's going to join us and talk to us a, a lot more around how Elemental Health is um, using their library of procedures to help us learn. And it, it, what I found fascinating in talking with her and learning more about it is, again, we have so many different ways to learn and um, we can't learn all at the same time. So really thinking about the challenges that our um, institutions and our care practices you know, how do you bring somebody all um, up, up to speed in personal protective equipment, in infection control, um, setting up your offices for social distancing? So she's got a lot of work that she's put together, um, her team, I shouldn't say her, but her team has put together. So again, thank you so much. And I'm going to sign out of this session and give you a moment to take a coffee break, a tea break, a hot chocolate break. Um, whatever it is that you guys enjoy. And we will see you in the next session with uh, Stefano and um, Todd. So thanks so much and have a, uh, thank you again for joining us. It's, it's great having you along. I really appreciate all of your questions.